Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Well, good morning. Today, as we continue our series in 1 John, we'll be examining chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. So I invite you to open your Bibles to that passage. Before we delve into it, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you tell us in Psalm 119 that your word is a lamp for our feet and a light on our path. And with that in mind, I pray as we examine this passage in 1 John, that we would regard it as such, and in so doing, that you would teach us by your Spirit from your Word, so we can apply it to our daily lives and be more conformed to the image of your Son. For Jesus' sake, amen. Some of you, particularly those of you who are a little older, may remember the Sunday School Times. It's a publication of the American Sunday School Union in Philadelphia. It ran from 1859 to 1966. But in 1974, the American Sunday School Union became the American Missionary Fellowship, which remains active today. Well, a story that once appeared in the Sunday School Times told of one night when a motorist was run down by a train at a grade crossing. And the old, man, uh, the old signal man in charge of the crossing had to appear in court. After a severe cross-examination, he was still unshaken. He said he had waved his lantern frantically, but to no avail. The following day, the superintendent of the line called him into his office. You did wonderfully well yesterday, Tom, he said. I was, at first, I was afraid at first that you might waver. No, sir, replied Tom, but I was afraid that old lawyer was going to ask me whether or not my lantern was lit. <laughs> well, as we continue our series in the book of 1 John today, we'll see that one of the key words in 1 John is light. In today's text, the Apostle John emphasizes that life without fellowship with God is like being shut away from the light. It's dark and cold depressing, and filled with illusions, similar, in a sense, to that story concerning Tom, the signal man, whose lantern was not lit. One of the Apostle John's themes in his gospel, as well as his first epistle, is that God is light. And this is the message of the life of our Lord Jesus. This is what he came to tell us and to show us. As light, he warms fills and fulfills and unveils reality to us by showing up what's false. But evidently, not to everyone. And this is the problem which we now must face. Why is it that some Christians seem to be transformed by Jesus Christ, their lives are perceptibly different, while others are not? Some Christians, even Christians of long standing, st seem still to be conformed to the world around them, and even deformed in their views and outlooks. And yet they stoutly assert that they're Christians, that they too have been born again by faith in Christ. It isn't strange then that the world asks, why is this the case? Well, the secret, John says, is fellowship. The reason he writes this letter is that we might understand this. As we saw last week in 1 John 1, 3, John writes, What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that ye may have fellowship along with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So, the key is fellowship. And we must distinguish and understand very clearly the difference between relationship and fellowship. Relationship is becoming a member of the family of faith or the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ. 
It's established simply by believing in Jesus for his promise of eternal life. In John 6, 47, Jesus himself said, anyone who believes in me has eternal life. And John makes that clear at the end of his letter, his first letter in 1 John 5, 12. The one who has the Son has life, or that is relationship. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life, or he does not have a relationship. You see, the Christian life starts right there with this matter of relationship. But fellowship is experiencing Christ. Relationship is receiving Christ. Fellowship is experiencing him. We can never have fellowship until we have established relationship. But we can certainly have relationship without fellowship. And that's what this letter of John emphasizes for us. Relationship puts us into the family of God, but fellowship permits the life of that family to shine out through us. And that's what marks the difference between Christians. Relationship, you see, is to be in the Lord, but fellowship is to be strengthened by the Lord in his, by his vast strength, as Paul says in Ephesians 6.12. Relationship means that all God has is potentially ours, but fellowship means that we're actually drawing upon that and his resources are visible in our experience. Relationship, it could be said, is we possessing God. Fellowship is God possessing us. Fellowship, then, is the key to vital Christianity. And that's why this letter, which calls us back to fundamental issues, touches first on that. The foundational truth behind this letter is that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. And that forms the basis for John's message. The relationship we already have because of this truth is fellowship with God and with other believers because we share eternal life within him. It isn't simply, you see, a matter of believers spending time together or enjoying each other's company. Fellowship with God should radically affect our behavior and determine the way we live, including our fellowship with one another, sharing his life and the knowledge of him. Furthermore, because God is light, we're able to and admonish to, admonish to walk in that light. Scripture is clear that as believers, we're either walking in the light or we're walking in darkness. We may like to think in terms of gray areas, but the Bible usually speaks in terms of black and white, walking in the light or walking in the darkness. In the Bible, the idea of walking is that of testing one's lifestyle. It's the most practical way of looking at life, right where we live, think, and walk each day. Consider some examples. Ephesians 5.8 says, Walk as children of light. Psalm 89.15 says, Happy are the people who know the joyful shout, Lord they walk in the light of your presence. Romans 6, 4, walk in newness of life. Romans 8, 4, do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Romans 13, 13, let us walk with decency. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Galatians 5, 16, walk by the spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Ephesians 4.1, walk worthy of the calling you have received. Ephesians 5.2, walk in love as Christ also loved us. Ephesians 5.15, walk not as unwise people, but as wise. And Colossians 2.6, therefore as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. Well, this morning we want to observe, observe five things about walking in the light. And this will help us keep from confusion about some of the things 1 John has to say. You see, how we walk, that is our habit of life, ultimately will determine what camp we're in. What then does John have to say about walking in the light? Well, in the first part of verse 5, John says it was communicated to us from Jesus Christ. Notice, he says, now this is the message we have heard in we have heard from him and declare to you. 
John here said that the entire concept of walking in the light was something we have heard from him. And having heard it from Jesus Christ, John was then going to declare to you and write to you, as he says in the following verses, or in verses 2 through 4. So it was obviously very important to John that believers know what it means to walk in the light that Jesus himself spoke of. The main reason why Christians never learn to how to walk is because they're following the wrong thing. We're not supposed to follow some person or fad or group. We're supposed to follow Jesus Christ and him alone. He is the standard for the way we are to live and walk. According to John, if we don't follow, or if we follow him, we will not walk as a habit of life in darkness. If we walk in darkness or live in sin and say we have fellowship with God, John says we're lying. We cannot walk in the light and walk in darkness then at the same time. Well, in the second part of verse 5, John says that walking in the light is centered in the moral character of God himself. Notice, he says, God is light and there's absolutely no darkness in him. How can we know God and walk with him and yet walk in darkness? Well, we can't. Why not? His moral character is entirely incompatible with the sin and that results from a life of walking in darkness. The two, you see, are mutually exclusive. John says about God in uh, chapter 2, verse 29, he is righteous. Chapter 3, verse 3, he is pure. Chapter 3, verse 5, in him there is no sin. And in chapter 3, verse 7, he is righteous. Moreover, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we're told that God made Jesus, who did not know sin, to be sin for us. And in Hebrews 4.15, we learn that he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And in James 1.13, we read, God cannot be tempted by evil. It's interesting that uh, in the New Testament, we find three essential declarations about God that will serve as definitions for us. And all three of them are given by the Apostle John. They are God is spirit, in John 4.24. God is light in 1 John 1, 5, and God is love, in 1 John 4, 8. It was the Greek philosopher Plato who said that light is the shadow of God. When John wrote that there is absolutely no darkness in him, or in him there was no darkness at all, he was using a double negative in the Greek language, which emphasizes the absolute purity of God and the impossibility of any moral imperfection. In 1 Timothy 6, 16, we read that he alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. God's moral purity reminds us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we must walk in moral perfection. Do we sin as Christians? <laughs> Of course, but we start with the principle that our habit of life should be moving from sin toward God's holiness, not living in sin with no progress. You see, when our eyes on the Lord, we see the ultimate victory over sin that's ahead of us, and we continue to move toward the light. Well, in verse 6, we see that walking in the light is contrasted with walking in darkness. John continues, if we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. In order for us to understand the situation John was talking about here, we need to consider three things. First, the claim is always easy to make. The verse begins, if we say. Again, the Greek grammar indicates a, what's called a third-class condition, which means if maybe you do and maybe you don't. We might translate it whenever you say. You know, plenty of Christians claim to be in fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness. The Bible says anyone who does that is lying and not practicing the truth. Secondly, our conduct is the crucial test. The phrase walk in darkness here is in the present tense, meaning it's an ongoing or habitual action. If our conduct then is one that's characterized by willful sin, 
we are lying. Thirdly, the conclusion we must draw in this situation is that we are lying and not practicing the truth. There's only one conclusion the Bible allows us to draw about a Christian who claims to be in fellowship with God and yet lives in sin. He or she is living a lie and is not practicing the truth. This is not a popular concept because we live in a culture that tolerates sin and accepts impure lifestyles in the name of love and, and forgiveness. Yet the same Bible that talks of God's love also speaks without compromise about sin. If we claim to be in fellowship and yet walk in darkness, John says we're lying. We're lying to God and men and are not practicing the truth. So what's the problem here? It's a very common condition. Perhaps some of us are suffering from this very condition at the present moment. Here's a Christian, John says, who has established a relationship with God. He or she has come into God's family by faith in Christ. And perhaps that relationship has been established for several years. The person has been a Christian for a long time. And he says he has fellowship with God. And that means he's experiencing life in the Spirit, the life of God. He claims that the life of Jesus Christ is his in experience as well as in potential. But John says there's no sign of it in his life. He doesn't live in a way that matches his claim. He doesn't live according to the truth. His life may be harsh, perhaps, and, and unloving, critical, and demanding of others. Or perhaps it's intemperate, frivolous, and flippant. Lived solely on the surface, shallow, and superficial. Or perhaps it's gossipy and sharp-tongued, or resentful and filled with bitterness. So what's wrong? Well, nothing is wrong with the relationship. It's no good talking to this person about becoming a Christian. He already is a Christian. He knows what it means to know Jesus Christ. So what's wrong? Well, John analyzes it. The problem, he says, is he's walking in darkness. And this is a greatly misunderstood phrase today. Most of us mentally read this as though it refers to having fallen into sin, uh, what was once called by some a backslidden condition, to having turned aside into willfulness or wickedness. It's the opposite, of course, of walking in the light. The opposite of that would be walking in darkness, that is, not behaving the way we ought. But if we view this phrase that way, we're confusing the cause with the results. The fact is, we sin because we walk in darkness. Walking in darkness, then, is not technically an equivalent term to sinning. We're sinning because we walk in darkness, and that's the problem. So what is darkness? Well, we must answer that first on the physical level. How would we go about getting this room dark? You know, it's now filled with light. Would we have to somehow get a big shovel and scoop out the light and shovel in the darkness? Of course not. We need only to turn off the light. Darkness is simply the absence of light. Whenever there's no light, there's darkness because, again, darkness is the absence of light. And that's precisely what John means here. To walk in darkness means to walk as though there were no God. For God is light. It's to be a practical atheist. Not an actual one, of course. We believe there's a God. We know he exists, but we live as though he doesn't. We don't want to expose ourselves to him. And that, my friends, is walking in darkness. And this is what John is describing here. It's possible to be a Christian and yet walk in darkness by, in a sense, turning God off. When we turn off the light, the darkness comes rushing in instantly. And this is not a rare condition at all. John starts with this problem because it's one of the most widespread and commonplace of problems. It's evident on every side. We can miss the benefits of God's presence in our hearts and lives by simply ignoring the light. And this is the case John brings before us. How do we do this? <clears throat> well, I'll be very practical here. 
Sometimes these biblical terms are so familiar to us that they fall on our ears without meaning. We really don't know what they describe, and therefore it's sometimes helpful to put them in other ways. How then do people actually do this? How do we turn off the light and walk in darkness? Well, there are some very obvious ways in which it is done. First of all, some people stop coming to church, and that's one way. The Word of God, as it's proclaimed from a pulpit like this, it's a channel of God's light. The Word itself is light. God says it penetrates and searches the hearts. It seeks out our inner life and exposes it to our view. And if we stop coming to church, we escape the light that way. We're no longer made uncomfortable or convicted by the Word of God. We discover that if we stay home, we don't experience the pricking of our conscience, which the light awakens. The writer of Hebrews warns us that there would be a tendency to do this as we draw near the close of the age. Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not stay away from worship meetings, or some translations, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves, as some habitually do, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, the delusions of the age are such that they tend to make us want to stay away from the light. It's more comfortable, in a sense, to sit around in our, in our old slippers of the flesh and enjoy oneself at home. And that's one way to turn off the light. Another way is to stop reading the scriptures. There are many who do this. An amazing number of Christians have simply turned off the light by ceasing to read the scriptures. They seldom open their Bible. They only hear a verse now and then, or, and they're content with what they get in church, but they seldom open it for themselves the other days of the week. Underneath all the excuses that are given for us, such as no time, lots of pressures, etc., there's really a desire to escape the light. You know, the word itself is light, but they prefer to walk in darkness. As author and humorist Mark Twain put it, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that, parts that bother me. It's the parts I do understand. Now, there are other more subtle ways to walk in darkness. One is to avoid examining ourselves. In other words, nod our head at the right places when the word's being expounded, but never apply it or ask questions of ourselves about what's being said. This is almost a certain way of walking in the darkness, one of the most common in our day. Perhaps the greatest cause of weakness among evangelical Christians today is that we seldom stop to examine ourselves. We don't ask ourselves soul-searching questions as to whether we are or where we are in the Christian life. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the Apostle Paul says to Christians, Examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. And he urges this kind of activity upon us. He says, in effect, don't go on taking it for granted that just because you're hearing the truth that you are obeying it. Ask yourself, where am I? Again, this testing is not for the purpose of determining whether we are saved. Paul was confident that his readers had already experienced God's saving grace in Christ, as he said earlier in 1 Corinthians 4, a 1 4. He wanted them to examine whether Christ's abiding presence was operating through them. Were they progressing in the true faith as disciples? Or were they, were they digressing due to sin and error? John says later in 1 John 4 1, test the spirits to determine if they are from God. In other words, examining what we're listening to and how we're thinking and compare it to the teaching of God's Word. We should be periodically asking ourselves the basic questions such as, what kind of a Christian am I? Am I farther along than I was six months ago? Am I easier to live with? Am I more gracious and compassionate than I was a year ago? I guarantee your spouse will give you an honest answer to that. And that's walking in the light. And to avoid it is to walk in darkness. It's putting on what could be called moral cosmetics. You know, when a lady puts on makeup on her face, it's a rather harmless matter since 
it only applies to her physical appearance. But we can do it on the spiritual level as well. We make ourselves up when we deceive others with a kind of image that we want them to believe we are. And that practice impedes Christian growth. If we want to appear to, if we appear to be mature when we, we're not, then we cannot be seen as needing anything. And if we won't admit our mistakes and our spiritual needs because we're afraid of what others might think, we cannot grow and we'll never grow. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You know, putting on a spiritual facade results in what the world likes to call gamesmanship. Games people play to keep from telling as little of the truth about themselves as they possibly can. A great tragedy occurs when Christians go right along with it and adopt these clever little games, pretending to be something that they are not. It's rather instructive that the first miracle, the miracle of judgment, that is, in the New Testament, occurred shortly after the day of Pentecost when Ananias and Sapphira were judged in Acts chapter 5 for pretending to be what they were not. Pretending to have a holiness that they did not actually possess. And note how destructive this is. The Holy Spirit is trying to grab our attention by that dramatic scene when these two fell dead, thus indicating the deadliness of pretense. This kind of pretense makes it impossible to help younger Christians. They're helped by seeing us overcome problems of life by the reaction of faith. And if we don't admit our problems, if we never talk about them, then our image to them is simply one of achieved perfection. And that's the most discouraging thing that um, young Christians can encounter. That's why for example, in our Saturday morning men's Bible study, we share BS, meaning blessings and struggles. You know, one of the most serious problems among Christians is when we refuse to admit that anything's wrong or that we have problems, or times when our own faith is being tested. And this is not saying that we need to, that we need to um, air out our dirty laundry in public. But if we never tell anyone about trials that we undergo, we walk in darkness. Remember again, John says that darkness is the absence of light. And to walk in the light then is to have everything open, exposed to God or to anyone else that may be interested. But to walk in darkness is, for example, to talk about love and joy and power, but to live a lie. It's from fellowship or sharing the life of Christ that there comes strength. To ignore light, then, is to choose weakness. So what's the answer? Well, we see that in verse 7, where John describes for us two more things about walking in the light. In verse 7, walking in the light is compared with the moral position of God himself. John writes, to start off this verse, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, you see, God is not halfway in the light. He is absolute. He's in absolute moral light. So if we're walking in the light in the same way that he is in the light, then and only then do we have fellowship with him. In other words, the, the way in which we are to walk in the light is compared directly to the moral position of God himself. And this leaves no room for half-hearted compromise. In Isaiah 2, 5, we read, Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And in Psalm 18, 28, David says, The Lord my God enlightens my darkness. Notice here that John does not say walk according to the light, because if he did, none of us could do it, because that would require sinless perfection. He told us in verse 5 that the light is totally free from any and all darkness. So the question is how we walk, or not how we walk, but where we are walking. In uh, 2 John, verse 4, we're told to be walking in the truth. And in 3 John, verses 3 and 4, we are again to walk in the truth. 
So what's the meaning of light in this context? Well, physically it represents glory and brilliance. Intellectually it represents truth and illumination. Morally it represents holiness and purity. Spiritually it represents life. So as John writes, walk in the light, that's the answer. And to put it on a practical level, in other words, not behaving perfectly, but examining ourselves, being willing to look at ourselves, to listen seriously to what others might say about us, and, and to ask ourselves how much truth there may be in it, and not immediately to grow defensive. You know, if we take down our fences and our spiritual facades and open up to others and tell them that uh, we're going tell them what we're going through, and encourage them to open up to us, admit our faults. This, friends, is walking in the light. As James says in chapter 5, verse 16 of his New Testament letter, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. If we share these and ask prayer about them, well then what? Well, John tells us later in this verse 7 where he makes his final point, point about walking in the light. Here he says that walking in the light is considered evidence of our relationship with God. He says, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. According to this passage, walking in the light is evidence of our relationship with Jesus Christ, and it has two results. First, it results in fellowship. John says, we have fellowship with one another. And according to the context of this passage, notice this does not refer technically to fellowship between believers, but to fellowship between the individual believer and God himself. John's point is that when we walk as, is that when we uh, believers, as believers, we walk in the light, we have something in common with God himself, namely the light. And it does not say that we might have, but that we will have fellowship with God. On a practical level, we discover that when we maintain an open and honest relationship with God, the light is shining on us. If we, white, if we walk in the light, despite our current condition as sinful people in this life, we immediately have fellowship with God's Son. We hold everything in common with Him. And with, that can, uh, with what that can mean in terms of power, love, enjoy in our life we need only to listen to the testimony of those who are experiencing it now but on only that but our fellowship with other christians will grow as well will become more approachable and sympathetic and uncritical we will lose our blaming demanding and critical spirit we'll give up our imperfection or our perfectionism our demand that everyone else should measure up we become much easier to live with. But there's also a second result, and it goes much deeper. John says it results in cleansing. According to this text, when we walk in the light, he says the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all or every sin. John mentions this because the inevitable accompaniment of evading light is guilt. We cannot walk in darkness without being guilty, feeling guilty. See, guilt is often the underlying cause of much Christian depression. It's the thing that creates that somber, uh, wet blanket approach that so many Christians demonstrate. It's because they're suffering from suppressed guilt and trying to make up for it in a rigid demanding code to sort of punish themselves for not being what they know they ought to be. It can even result in certain physical afflictions such as insomnia or, or nervous habits or ulcers and so on. You see, to walk in the light means to hide nothing, to defend ourselves neither from the light of God nor in any way to appear, try to appear to be something that we are not. It means to come instantly without defensiveness to the light and to deal with it before God. If we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus, God's Son, is continually cleansing, cleansing us from sin. And it's in the present tense here, indicating it's done instantly and continuously all the time. And this is the provision that God has made for us. 
Compare this, for example, with what uh, we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 13 reminds us that he has rescued us from the domain of darkness. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, we read, but you, brothers, are not in the dark. Again, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 tells us, you were all sons of light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. And 1 Peter 2, 9 reminds us that we have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, when we trust Christ, not only are all of our past sins forgiven, but all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven, and we are cleansed. And this cleansing includes not only forgiveness and the removal of guilt, but also sanctification and purity. And this is why the 18th century British hymn writer Augustus Toplady could write his famous verse, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself, my, myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. When the 18th century evangelist John Wesley was returning home from a service one night, he was robbed. The thief, however, found his victim to have only a little money and some Christian literature. As the bandit was leaving, Wesley called out, Stop! I have something to give you. The surprised robber paused. My friend, said Wesley, you may live to regret this sort of life. If you ever do, here's something to remember. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The thief hurried away, and Wesley prayed that his words might bear fruit. Years later, Wesley was greeting people after a Sunday service when he was approached by a stranger. What a surprise to learn that this visitor, now a believer in Christ and a successful businessman, was the one who had robbed him years before. I owe it all to you, said the transformed man. Oh no, my friend, Wesley exclaimed, not to me, but to the precious blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. John Wesley really did have something to give the thief that night, the good news of salvation, and it's free. And we have the same responsibility to share the gospel of Christ with those who cross our paths. Well, as we close the, this portion of 1 John today, we might do well to ask ourselves, what evidence can I observe in my own life that would indicate whether or not I am walking in the light? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> uh, thank you that uh, as we've been reminded by the Apostle John today that you by nature are light. And as he says, there's absolutely no darkness in you. Thank you for uh, not only offering a positional relationship with you as a free gift, uh, but also making that relationship something we can daily experience. We can experience through an ongoing fellowship in which your life can shine through us. Help us as your children through faith in your Son to walk in your light this week by allowing your word to penetrate our minds and actions so that we would in turn be transparent with you and with others. Thank you, Lord, also for the power of Jesus' blood, which continually cleanses us relationship, uh, relationally before you as our Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.